You are listening to audio from Citizens Church Elmira. You can find more resources and learn more about our church at citizensalmira.ca. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Am I on? Oh, there we go. All right. The sound of the next generation is fading, and we can uh, begin. It's good to be with you all. Um, as already has been mentioned this morning, our theme uh, is hope. So I thought I'd start by talking about a lady from Atlanta. Her name was uh, Ann Nixon Cooper, and her years were 1902 to 2009. If you're a mathematician, that's a long time. Uh, she lived to be 107 years old, but probably what's most uh, known about her is that she was mentioned by Barack Obama in his speech in 2008 when he became the first African-American president of the United States. And he said the following words. I'll spare you my Obama impression. Um, maybe at a dinner party sometime. But he said this in 2008 in Chicago after winning his historic election. He said, one thing that's on my mind tonight is about a woman who cast her ballot in Atlanta. She's a lot like the millions of others who stood in line to make their voice heard in this election, except for one thing. Ann Nixon Cooper is 106 years old. She was born just a generation past slavery, a time when there was no cars on the road or planes in the sky, when someone like her couldn't vote for two reasons, because she was a woman and because of the color of her skin. And tonight I think about all that she's seen throughout her century in America, the heartache and the hope, the struggle and the progress, the times we were told that we can't, and the people who pressed on with that American creed. You think about Ann Nixon being born in 1902. Uh, she was born... Um, as the granddaughter of slaves. Her grandparents are still alive, so she probably sat around the kitchen table talking to people who had actually been enslaved. Uh, and the same person went out and voted for a, a black man as president of the United States. All politics aside, partisanism, that is a pretty impressive thing to think about when you think about the history of a country. If, if uh, she would have told her grandparents sitting at the table, you know, one day I'm gonna vote for a black man, they would have probably thought, she's crazy. Talk about hope. So think about what comes to your mind when you think about the word hope. You probably came into this room this morning like um, Darren already alluded to with different hopes and expectations, um, things that you are hoping for, uh, things that you think about with Christmas. Uh, we've been observing here at Citizens a time of preparation, a reflection, Advent, thinking about preparing our hearts for the coming of Jesus. And today's story is something that's kind of overlooked within the Christmas story often, or it's not generally the first thing that you might think about from the Christmas story of Luke 2. Uh, it's this kind of tucked away little portion that Luke talks about, these two people that we don't know much about other than their stories here in the text from Luke. The first guy is a guy named Simeon, and I'm just going to jump back into the verses again to give us some context for what's going on. Uh, so we'll start at uh, verse 25, uh, and we'll read until 33 again, just to uh, get into the story. And it says, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God saying, sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which was prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too." Some scholars believe that uh, Simeon was mentioned by the uh, Jewish historian Josephus, who was not a Christian but was a Jew, and wrote a lot about the time period that we are in here in the text. He doesn't spe Josephus doesn't specifically say Simeon was this guy in the temple, but when scholars put things together, they're pretty sure that this guy may have been a member of the Jewish council. If that's the case, then Simeon's not just a random dude who wandered into the temple one day. He's an a influential Jewish uh, man who is part of the, the ruling class. And so by this account, he has some clout within the community. 
But what's striking in this text, and what really stood out to me when I was reading the text, is that uh, Simeon has a very personal relationship with God. It says that the Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he was going to see the Messiah, which means that the Holy Spirit had spoken to him in a very intimate way, that he wasn't going to die until the Messiah came. It said that hope rested on this man. You would think that if you were a friend of Simeon, that maybe you would, uh, if you knew this prophecy that he had in his heart, you'd probably be asking him a lot about who he'd been hanging out with, right? Have you met the Messiah yet? Uh, You think about the time period uh, that we're in right now. This is, uh, there's been like 400 years of silence within the Jewish faith, meaning that God hadn't audibly spoken or through the prophets to the Jewish people in a very long time. Rome has oppressed the people of Israel for a long time. Uh, It's not a a fun time to be a Jewish person. This is not the height of the Jewish empire when, you know, David was king and they were really rulers of a large part of the Near East, but rather they are completely oppressed. God seems silent, and yet there's this guy coming into the temple saying, I've been told I'm not going to die until the Messiah comes. So God's not manifesting his presence like he was in the past. He's not parting the Red Sea. He's not a pillar of fire. He's not speaking in real time through prophets in the temple. And yet God is in the move in the hearts of men and women like Simeon and Anna. It says that um, the, when you think about the significance of this encounter, it happened in the temple. And one commentator said that the temple is like the locus of God's presence, the meeting place between the divine and the human. I can't think of who painted the painting, but there's that painting of Adam's hand reaching up to God's hand, you know, the very famous one. I thought of that when I heard of that, this idea that in the temple during the time of Israel was the God's dwelling place, the closest space that would, you would feel the presence, the very dwelling presence of God. And the presence of God is thick here. So when Simeon is holding the Christ child, think about what's happening in that moment. In the temple, in the locus of God's presence where God the Father is dwelling, the Holy Spirit is in Simeon, and the God, the Son, is in Simeon's arm. The Trinity is uniting um, in the temple. It's always united. But it's uniting in the temple as a space to fully say God's mission, God's place in the world is happening. And Simon makes this declaration. It echoes like Isaiah, uh, where he says, I'm sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you can dismiss your servant in peace. I'm good to go. I've met him. I've seen him. I've got the Son of God in my arms. And he calls prophecy to who this child is. He says, I have seen the, sorry, you have prepared in the sight of all nations a light to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Interesting line there about a revelation to the Gentiles. Think about what that would mean for the Jews that heard that right now. They're not exactly... um, interested in being a light to the Gentiles because the Gentiles are oppressing them and holding them down. But Simeon seems to, again, through the power of the Holy Spirit, understands who Jesus is, that Jesus is a light to the nations, that through Israel, as promised at the beginning of time, through this unveiling story from creation until now, it has always been about all of humankind. It has always been about God's light to all people through the people of Israel. And then, interestingly enough, Simeon turns and he addresses Mary directly. Uh, It says that he said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, to a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. It's fascinating that he takes time to look directly at Mary and talk to her about her own personal experience, not just hers, the people of Israel, but her experience of what it's going to be like to be the mother of Israel. Jesus. Scholars think that Luke, he says at the beginning of Luke that he interviewed over 500 people, right? He says, you know, the, the, I interviewed all these eyewitnesses and that's, this is how I got my historical account. And they're pretty sure that one of those eyewitnesses was Mary, that Luke was in the room with Mary writing down her story, which would make sense based on how much information we have of the one-on-one encounters that Mary had with the angel, that Mary has with Simeon here. And so, It's interesting how that we see Mary's story and the particular care that the Holy Spirit inspired scriptures give to tell us the experience that Mary had. That while it was a wonderful, hopeful thing to carry the Son of God, it was also a devastating thing because she carried a a son that would eventually get murdered in front of her. And it seems that Simeon is telling us that that's coming. 
and he's revealing that as much as they could understand in the moment of what that's going to look like. And maybe he's preparing Mary in some ways for the trauma that's going to come her way, that redemption, though wonderful and glorious, is going to come with deep pain and fear along the way. Right on the heels of this prophecy uh, comes another uh, really interesting little moment, and we have a prophetess in the temple named Anna. It's a chance this lady's as old as Ann Nixon Cooper was. Um, scholars aren't sure. If you look at the way it's written, it sounds like she was a widow for 84 years, uh, which in ancient times, that's crazy. That means even if she was married at 13 or 14, I mean, she's, she's up in the hundreds. There's a chance, though, that the way it's translated, she's actually 84 years old, again, which is um, significantly old for that, that time period. Either way, she's been around a long time. Uh, and she's been in the temple, she's been fasting, she's been praying, and it sounds like she's been just dwelling in the presence of God. That's about all we know about her. Just a faithful woman of the Lord that Luke takes time to write about. Some people say, well, maybe she was fasting until Jesus came. Um, and other people say, no, she was probably just fasting as one commentator, as an expression of her hope in the form of a prayer, entreating God to set things right. I like how it says that, just fasting as a way to entreat God, please set things right for our people. And Anna comes up to Jesus, who's in the arms of you know, his mother, uh, and she starts linking him to the redemption of Jerusalem. It's quite a day at the temple for Mary and Joseph. They have two very distinct prophecies coming from both a man and a woman, giving a prophecy to this woman in your arms, even though they'd seen an angel you know, a couple years before that, what a great reminder for them, for Mary and Joseph and the people in the temple, that this little person in your arms is fully human but fully God and is going to change everything in the course of history. So that the text today ends with, with Mary and Joseph heading back home to Nazareth, but for us in the room that are believers, we know that this is really just maybe as the Son of God or as a coming Messiah. And for that day for Simeon and for that day for Anna, it was hope fulfilled. I don't know if Anna had a specific prophecy that she was going to meet Jesus face to face, but we know Simeon did. And for him, it was finally recognized near the end of his life. Roman rule, occupation, God seeming silent, all coming to kind of an end and a climax here in the temple with this little baby. So let's take the text uh, into today, into Elmira in 2022. Uh, we find ourselves in a world that is vastly different than the world that we have our story in today and a world that is very much the same. We still have oppressive empires, wealth and disparity of poverty side by side, violence and hate, lots of depraved moral conscience in our political discourse, and this longing for hope. Um, back in 1997, you too wrote a song, If God Would Send His Angels. It's a really interesting song, and I'll read a couple of the lyrics for you. Um, and the, it goes like this. They write uh, and sing, God's got his phone off the hook. Would he even pick it up if he could? It's been a while since we saw that child, hang, child hanging around this neighborhood. See his mother in the doorway dealing, see Father Christmas with a begging bowl, and Jesus' sister's eyes are a blister, the high street never looked so low. It's the blind leading the blind, it's the cops collecting for the cons, so where's the hope and where's the love? And what did you say to me? Does love light up your Christmas tree? The next minute you're blowing a fuse, and the Cartoon Network turns it into news. If God would send his angels, if God would send a sign, well, if God would send his angels, where would we go from here? So that's art, and it's a little bit abstract. Um, but Bono was asked, what were you saying in that song? Uh, and he said, I think it's a song of quiet anger at the way the world is and God's failure to intervene. Interesting line. Bono identifies as a Christian, so it may be rhetorical. Um, but it's this idea that, I think the part that stood out to me was, it's a song of quiet anger at the world and God's failure to intervene. When you think about the baby in Simeon's arms, familiar ver verses uh, from Isaiah 9, 2 to 7, I'll read those. Prophecy long, long ago, before this ever happened in the temple, 
It says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You've enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice at you as people rejoice at harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunderers, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will rule, reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time and on forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish it. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. So that's the light of the world, Jesus, the Son of God, and that is the hope. It's the hope that brings, I'm guessing, the majority of you in here this morning, that Jesus stepped into our space as a baby. In the muck and mire of the humanity, he took on our sins and eventually ended up on a Roman cross. He went down to the tomb, but on the third day, he rose again, defeating death, sin, and darkness. The baby at the temple would walk all the way to the cross, and at the cross, in his death, he would blaze a trail of glory back to the throne room of the Father, inviting us all in. If you're here this morning and you're not a believer, that's the crux of Christian faith. That's what Christianity is. Christmas is awesome. Lights, trees, food, songs from the 50s. You know, and those things are beautiful, and they remind us of a life well-lived or a life lived fully a life lived with thriving. But the Christmas story is actually kind of dark, not cute and fluffy. Uh, it starts out quiet enough, baby in a manger, but it kind of, it ends on a hill with violence and death, Jesus bleeding out, nailed there, dying for anybody who accepts the free gift of grace. I submit to you two that God has intervened in the world and that while there is some quiet anger at the pain and that there is pain and suffering, God's intervention happened 2,000 years ago and began what he's always been doing, a great story of restoration. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that anybody, whoever believes, can have everlasting life. That's the hope that is, the hope that's already been accomplished through Jesus Christ. But the other good news this morning is that there is a hope that is to come. If you're here this morning and you're a believer uh, or not, you know that life isn't, just because you put your faith in Jesus doesn't mean that everything goes smoothly, and we've talked about that uh, quite a bit here as we think about what it means to be a Christian. Um, the Bible says that as Christians, we're wrestling against powers of darkness. We wrestle against our own flesh, and we wrestle against the world. We face loss. We face pain, sadness, suffering, confusion. We, spent our, you know, we started our morning praying for a family uh, you know, with, with a baby with complications. Um, and there is nothing fair about uh, one baby being born healthy and one not. Uh, it is confusing and, and difficult for us to wrestle through. Um, and I'm sure that some days you could sing with Bono, I can, that if God's got his phone off the hook, would he even pick it up if he could? So as believers, maybe you can imagine with me that we, we are in the temple again, in the dwelling place where God is, and we are waiting for hope. If you're a Christian, you're indwelled with the Holy Spirit, meaning that the temple of God is within you, that when you go everywhere you go, God is with you, he dwells within you, and through the redemptive work of Jesus, if you've accepted that, that dwelling presence walks with you wherever you go, whispering in your heart. The scripture says that it whispers to us, Abba, Father, telling us who our Father is, even when we don't have the words. The Spirit utters and groans for us. First Peter 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now, even for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the testing, so that, sorry, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, 
more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. When Jesus went back to the Father, he told us he was going to come back again and that one day he was going to set all things new. Uh, language that people use, and I think I've heard Darcy use it here before, uh, is the already but not yet. This idea that we are in the already here, uh, the already being accomplished through Jesus Christ, that we have hope in Jesus, that we live in the hope of Jesus. But as we all know too well, the not yet exists and that we live still with the veil between us and what is to come. And the hope that we light the candle for this morning is twofold. Like I said, it's the hope that has come in Jesus Christ, and it's the hope that is to come in the final consummation when Jesus comes back here to dwell with us and make all things new. Sometimes it's easy uh, to get very naturalistic and think about this world as just this place, as just this here and now, and just the moments that we dwell, that we live. But the reality of being a Christian and the reality of the hope that we hang on to is that this moment that we live now, as the Bible describes, is just a vapor. It's just a foretaste. It's just a shadowing. Those really good Christmas dinners, those moments where everything feels just right, are just a glimpse, just a, just, just a tiny little space that shows us what is to come when Christ comes and just makes everything new. I feel like as a Christian, that's so much of what we say with people when we sit with them when they're hurting or when we sit with our own pain, right? It's going to be made new one day. I don't know how to answer your, your, your question right now in, the, you know, in the, all the particulars of what's going on, but one day, this will all make sense. and It'll all make sense to us. Revelation 21, 1 through 7. Then I, John, so this is John writing. He's seeing a vision. John, who walked with Jesus, sat with Jesus, is saying, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. To those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. I can't think of a more hopeful scene than that to think about this morning as we walk uh, into our uh, at final kind of section of Advent and as we think about Christmas and we think about 2023 as we close the chapter on another year. One day, God himself will walk among us and we will walk into that holy city with him. And that's our hope at Advent, that one day all things will be made new. We will have resurrected bodies to walk in the new world. No COVID, um, tears wiped away, forever with Emmanuel, God with us. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for that declaration of yourself that you are Emmanuel, that you are with us. That as Christians, we know that our faith is not um, just ethereal, that it is something very material. Um, the physical and the spiritual come together in you, Jesus, that your incarnation as a baby was so much more than just trying to show us something, but you were truly doing something here in the world. When you came and stepped into our brokenness, became broken, and then paved a way back into the presence of God. Lord, for those of us that are believers, we are so grateful for that. We're grateful to be uh, called your sons and your daughters, that we can sit in your throne room with boldness because of what happened, uh, because of the hope that started in the manger and ended uh, in the empty tomb. For anyone that's not a believer here this morning, I pray that you would um, gently touch hearts, show your love, your grace, uh, and reveal yourself to them. And God, for all of us today, may you always uh, keep us reminded of the truth of your presence, your closeness, even when it might feel uh, as though you are not. We pray these things in the name of uh, a resurrected Jesus. Amen.